does professionally is he provides irrefutable objective data for what it is we do. And what I wanted to do, I know we've talked about this. He could bring all kinds of presentations, and the same with like Dr. Rosner. What I think is most powerful, I want everybody to know the story behind this guy because your, your technology, you know, after a few minutes, people look at it. Here's, it's amazing. But I want them to know about the guy. The guy. Okay. Is this on? Yeah, it is. So I want to start with what brought you in to the world you're in professionally right now? Because unlike the people in here, you went down the road of science. Right. So why don't you tell us a little bit about your story? At four years old, um, I fixed the dryer that was making all kinds of noise. And my father said to my mother, leave him alone. <laughs> <laughs> leave him alone. I'm four years old. I can take my bicycle completely apart, put it back together. I fixed the dryer. And they said, my father said, leave him alone. Let him do whatever he wants. And at four, I literally took the dryer apart. It was making noise in the basement. And ever since then, I've been inventing things. So I started at a very young age. Uh, my uh, third grade teacher, her barrette, her, her hair clip, the metal came off it. So I went to the pharmacy and bought copper sulfate. And I put a battery and I, 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 brought, I plated her, her barrette for her. I put it, gave it back to her the next day. Well, it took 24 hours. But so I've been doing this since I was a child. So it's just built, it's genetic, it's built in, the DNA. <laughs> curious, curious, yes. Intellectually curious, that's it. So, like, why are you doing what you're doing? That's what I want to know. No, just kidding. <laughs> so I did that, and so what happened was I, um, I went into high school and studied, uh, I took all the advanced classes. Uh, I was a terrible student, um, but I uh, never followed the rules. I never t did any homeworks. Um, when I went to school as an undergraduate, I, I studied physics. And the reason I studied physics was it was the only course you didn't have to write a paper. And so, and it was also natural to me. I didn't have to think too much about it. Um, and then when I got done with my physics degree, uh, I went to California. I got a job working at Eula Packard and was working there for about a year, bored to death. Uh, and I went to a, uh, a university and I said, I want to do research in psychology, animal behavior. I'm really interested in animal behavior. I went in, there was a British woman with big, big purple earrings standing there, and I go, she, she knows, she's older, she has to know, her name was Rose Ginsburg, she was this genius, she was one of the people that uh, was arrested for protesting the Vietnam War, and I went and I said, I have a degree in physics, I'm this, this, she goes, oh, they would love you at NASA, and she was the <laughs> interface between the university and NASA Ames Research Center, and to get into the NASA university program, where they put you through your degree, through your PhD, is extremely difficult. And I went to NASA the next day and met with a James Hartzell. He was uh, the director of this group. And he took me in the lab, and this was a, a ergonomics lab where we were studying, um, developing technologies for the helicopter, making things easier for pilots, et cetera, but all design stuff. In the craziest place, the people on the right, the movie The Right Stuff, I worked with two of the people that were in that movie, believe it or not. And uh, I walk in and he, and he says, he's so tired of explaining technology, and he said, we have trouble with this hand controller to fly the F-16 in the helicopter. And I go, and he says, it's made with this, and he's really tired going, and he's trying to explain it. I go, it's just a Wheatstone bridge. He goes, you know what a Wheatstone bridge is? <laughs> and, and that's it. I was instantly in the most difficult program to get into the United States. He just put me in, that was it because I knew what a Wheatstone Bridge was, and that was it. <laughs> He's like, oh my God, I don't have to explain to you what all this is. I, I'm not that smart, but for other people that wouldn't have it's just a Wheatstone a re, it's Bridge. Just, a Wheatstone Bridge is just that when you apply pressure on, the, on a, uh, an, a, an object, it will flex, and that flexion, the motion in the object translates into electrical signals. So you can actually, as it, as it deforms, just like with a needle on a record, similar thing. As it deforms, it picks up electrical activity, which you can measure and then translate into motion. 
So that's all it is. It's just a, that's what we eat from bridges. And well, anyways, uh, so then I was at the space program, and they, uh, I decided to study the, the impact of that same hand controller. I decided everyone would get out of the simulator and go, oh, this hurts so much. And, but they performed so well. That, that they said we're going to keep it. And I, I decided, well, I want to objectively evaluate. From the day I was born, I've always wanted to objectively evaluate everything. So I came up with the use of service electromography, and I measured the muscle fatigue in these pilots. And their fatigue was so bad with that controller that they redesigned the controller. We worked together to make it one that was called force compliance. It moved and it also used the force part at the same time. So it was a middle ground thing. And at that point, um, kind of like a bet, I wrote a grant proposal to the National Institutes of Health. And I drank two beers. I was too young to know better. And this is, there were two grants off that were awarded that year. And I wrote this proposal. And it's for $450,000, which is like probably $4 million now. And um, drank a couple of beers, wrote this proposal. And everyone bet there's no way I'd get it. And at the time, I was at IBM's think tank. I actually went from NASA to the think tank at IBM, where we did the first study of, of text messaging in 1986, believe it or not. Uh, we had to shut it down because everyone got in big fights reading text without <laughs> the voice and, and the face. So it was pressed. Yeah. And so anyways, the, uh, um, the, I, I stuck it on my boss's door at, at uh, IBM. The, uh, the letter that said I was given the grant. So I developed the grant. I developed the machine for measuring muscle activity, skin temperature, all these things. And then uh, I made it, I only showed it once. But somehow somebody told a chiropractor. This chiropractor named Bill McIlvain, William McIlvain, who's famous because, and I was raised in Syracuse, New York. I lived next door to a chiropractor. So my knowledge of chiropractors were crazy guy who drives a GTO. That's what I knew. <laughs> <laughs> he used to throw us in the back. He'd maybe take a sled. There was one year of GTOs where the front end was rubber. He'd maybe take a sledgehammer to it to show that you could actually hit it with a sledgehammer and wouldn't hurt the car. It was true. I don't know if you ever see, saw this before. But anyways, that was my knowledge of, of, of chiropractors. Drive fast, GTO. This is like you. Without the American cars. I, I, I'm in yeah. Germany. Yeah. I love German cars. Well, the Germans, my, the surgeon friend in Seattle who's famous, uh, uh, Jens Chapman drives a Shelby GT, GT. I think it's funny. The Germans like American cars. We like, you know. Anyhow, um, so then I went, and, you know, I race cars. So anyhow, um, the, uh, uh, the grant uh, was awarded. I made that. But Bill said, look, I think this could work for chiropractors. And I said, I have no idea. I don't know anything about it. It doesn't make sense. I thought of voluntary muscles only. I never thought about the impact on the spine, but it's involuntary. And so what happened was I said, he, would, he wouldn't get in a plane to come see me. He was a, in the B-17 bomber in World War II. He sat in the little turret underneath firing the gun, and he lost his testes, actually, because he froze in it. Uh, a bullet went through um, the, the heating suit, and he didn't die from that, but he actually froze. Um, anyhow, he wouldn't fly, but I flew up to see him in Oregon. He's one of those individuals arrested for, for uh, practicing medicine without a license in New York State, uh, but was pardoned by the governor of Oregon so he could be on the board, because technically he was a felon. All right, very famous guy. So I went to his office, and we tested all of his patients. And my God, the muscle tension patterns about the spine matched identically, matched up with, well, big surprise. What's the body's natural defense mechanism to pain and muscle uh, subluxation? Muscle guarding, right? That's the muscles, too. So they matched up everything. Sure, you see the compensation patterns perfectly, except for one guy. And I'm like, I have, I'm at a loss. I said, I, I need to know why this one person does not match at all with what you told me was wrong. And uh, we would test first, then he would tell me it was wrong. And he, and then I sa he said, it was just, I threw him in to see if I could throw you off. Oh, I thought you were going to say he's from Chicago. Nah, <laughs> no. Just a joke for the Dibley boys. Yeah, the Dibley. <laughs> <laughs> Dibley kept me up so late last night that I was up all night long thinking about everything we talked about. It was insane. So, um, uh, so then what happened was that I, uh, that's what led me into the chiropractic arena. And I was saying there was a whole bunch of machines that existed prior. Uh, this time around, 
uh, about nine years ago I, when I came up with the, the current system, which is both the Myovision wireless and then the Dynaram, which is a motion. The, uh, as you can see, the American Medical Association finally folded, and they have my device in as the gold standard. So they chose a chiropractic tool as the gold standard. So if you open this book up, it's my machine. So I've been testifying in trials like crazy um, the motion EMG that I patented measures range of motion and muscle guarding simultaneously. So you can see not only how far they can go bend, but you can see their muscle guarding simultaneously, which exposes what? That 70% of the people have normal range of motion, but muscle guarding, and we can prove it now. So they're calling it the lie detector for back pain. Um, and it led for, to me being on the, I was on TV on, you know, Law and Order, the Law and Order series. Do you know that I was on Law and Order last year? No. I was the star expert witness on the new series, Law & Order, You the Jury. It's a real jury trial on TV. And why did I end up on that show supplanting all the medical doctors and chiropractors? Um, I had data to prove that the cop who was kicked in the head in an arrest was not faking his injuries. And I, one of the things I learned at NASA, and, and Dibble and I were talking about this last night, that that uh, individual differences are the norm. That was hammered into us at NASA. And I want to tell this to chiropractors, please remember, individual differences are the norm. So when you learn a technique, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail, right? Everyone's different. You know, one of the, the coolest things about my technology, I loved, I was telling the story about this uh, upper cervical guy in Seattle. He bought it to impress patients. He wanted to impress patients with objective data, right? That was the goal. And he thought 100%, why do I need it? I don't need it for anything. My hands can tell me everything. That's what he said, okay? A year later, he calls me up. He goes, David, I bought this to impress patients. And I was losing patients quite often. I didn't know why. I'd adjust them and say, how do you feel? And they say, great. And then he'd never see them again. And he goes, I didn't know why. And then he goes, with your device, I thought I was doing it to impress them. I got feedback that what I was doing wasn't working on everybody. So he said, I started mixing up what I did as technique. I go, does that make sense? Does everyone have the same problem? No. He goes, but without your machine, I would have never known that. I'm not losing patients anymore. And, and when I can't help them, I at least know that, and I can send them out to somebody else. Well, this is, this is Patient-centered care, that's what this is about. That's the whole point. This that's is what I do. This is why I wanted you here. Because your anal retentiveness, my anal retentiveness, German doctor's anal retentiveness. Ich habe ein Wohnzimmer. <laughs> That's all I know in German, so I say it. Uh, objective says data, data. Yeah. I'm always saying. Yeah. Objective data. That if you're not measuring something, mm -hmm. what the hell are you doing? Yeah. You're, you're, I say this. If you're a cardiologist and you don't have an EKG, what are you going to do? But you're, you're in trouble. When I went to, as you know, I don't know if you do know this, Gilles here, thank you. You have reinvigorated me, by the way. You have made me believe now there is hope because we discussed having grand rounds at the school. Gilles has been, he is brilliant, this man. And, and you know something, he's so adaptable. He took one look at myself and he goes, this makes total sense, and boom, 32 units are ordered by Life University for the school. And, and, and the, the reality is that they want them because they know this is critical to our survival. But one of the docs, and, and, and you know, unfortunately some of the older docs see it as an insult, that there's a tool that can do what you can, there's, but you should be trusting me. This is everyone, medical doctors, chiropractic, makes no difference. You should trust me. And it's like, where in the world do you trust? I mean, when you take your car to get it fixed, they plug in a scanner to see what's wrong, right? They, they won't, the BMW will not pay for a repair without a code. So, but what, what ended up happening was the, um, the schools have, have all now integrated, Palmer has, but I talked to Palmer West, I talked to the clinic director, and we did this lecture, and she said this. She said, I do not, I've been to court a million times. Now, I've been to court to the Supreme Court in Florida. I established the validity. If you want to look up this case, dynaram.com, it was the largest case in chiropractic history that nobody knows about. And the truth is that I had a competitor at the time who paid all the publications to not publish this because it was such a huge case. And they wanted to wipe out chiropractors. That's what this case was really about. But the, the question was, is my tool valid? And I went myself, by myself, against the state of Florida, 300 insurance companies, 75 attorneys. Can, nine. I, can I say this yes. as a chiropractor so you don't have to brag on yourself? 
David used his technology in court to prove chiropractic was valid. And what he's saying, it is one of the greatest milestones that people don't know about globally in chiropractic that occurred because everything occurs in America with changes with legal cases. And this case changed everything because if you can't justify chiropractic in the court of law, is there ever gonna be any profession in the future? It hasn't happened this way in Europe, so. No, it's happening in England, by the way, the UK. There's a thing called, I've been contacted, I've been contacted by Royal Sun Alliance. Uh, they, the UK, there's more, there's the crash for cash is what's going on in the UK. So I'm getting more attention there for this because they see it's, it's value for that. But this is, I wanna say this is really important. The Palmer West clinic director said, one of them, she was below the clinic director, she said, I can use my, I went into Western State and said, what do you do that subjective data? They go, visual range of motion. I'm going, you've got to be kidding me. You're supposed to be the science school. Yeah, that's you know, but I, Yeah, but so I said to Palmer, same thing. And, they, and she said, well, I can use, I've been in court a million times. I looked it up. She was in court last 25 years ago. That was it. So I said, oh, my God, you don't need that. Of course you don't need this. You can use your eyes to visually range. And I said, I contacted Stanford University Hospital, and I asked them. And they said, we're pulling out all the EKG machines. We have stethoscopes. We don't need EKGs for our cardiologists. I was joking, of course. And I got an email from her clinic, her boss, who said that was exactly what she needed to hear. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. But the reality is that, that this has made such an impact for all the schools to acknowledge its value and want it. Because, they, you know, honestly, they're concerned that the students will never be able to pay their loans back at this point, too. Because the students graduating are very techy, they're very technology oriented. They know the value of objective data, but our whole society is data driven, right? So if you don't have data, where are you? You're the cardiologist with no EKG. That's the sad place to be. When it's so easy, you spend 250,000 on education, it's so easy to spend a little teeny bit amount to make sure that no one can question what you're doing. And you can learn whether what you're doing works. Patient-centered care is not just a word you say or a term. You really Im implement patient-centered care. That means seeing it from the patient's perspective. You said that when you started. I love the way you said that. You see it from their eyes. So I'm doing it from seeing it from their body. Make sense? Same thing. It's a standard. It's a standard. And we've, uh, we've done... Um, both motion and static studies, and we've done more and more, doing more and more research um, on this on a continuous basis. Uh, Life is publishing the study on reliability, test free test reliability. That's been the biggest issue with the machines out there, which has damaged the credibility, is reproducibility has been so bad with them. So this machine, the test free test reliability was 0.96 in the study that was just completed. So, excellent. So last question. Yes. Because some people that haven't met you <laughs> in here, they want to know, so I'm going to ask them for them, while you're here this weekend, would you run scans on people's cervicals so they can experience it? I can do the whole, yeah, whatever, the full spine. It's so fast. David's going to be out there, so I'll I ask up. him, I want him to share a story. There's, there's so much. It's so fascinating about you. So I encourage all of you to spend a little time talking to him and asking him. That he has other hobbies that are fascinating, too. I'm a bounty but hunter not... as well. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> so. I know about your love of adrenaline. Yeah. I, okay. I, is it in the water in central New York? I, I don't, don't know, know what happened there. <laughs> Something happened, but we both got the same thing. It's the same. I know. Well, listen, so, right. I, really, I really appreciate Great. you.